are going to be recording this session, which I have just started now. Um, and that means that if you have to drop off at any moment, we'll be able to send you the full presentation. Um, and folks that weren't able to join us today will have that as well. Please make sure that you have your microphone muted um, just in case you're multitasking and you don't want us to pick up on whatever it is that you're working on. We are going to be utilizing the chat extensively for our question period. So if you have questions as we're going through a specific part of the presentation, then just drop it in the chat and one of us um, or another member of our team. We have lots of other great Mount Vernon team members who are with us today. We have Jared Colley, the head of learning and innovation. We have Bo Adams, who is our interim head of the upper school, as well as our chief learning and innovation officer. Um, and then joining us later, we will have uh, some of our deans of students as well. So please feel free to drop any questions that you have in the chat. Um, but with that, we're gonna go ahead and kick it off by talking to you a little bit about what it is that we do. Um, so this picture is near and dear to my heart for a lot of reasons. One, because two of my favorite humans, my counterparts, Ariel and Ryan are in it. Uh, but two, because we get the opportunity in a non-COVID world to take students on tours of colleges. Um, and when you work in higher education and you work in admissions, you just fall in love with different campuses and you fall in love with being able to help students start to picture themselves there. So this is a picture of us on a college tour two summers ago at my alma mater, Samford University in Birmingham. Um, and this was a group of juniors and seniors at the time that we were working with. And we are very excited for the days where we can bring the college tour back. Mount Vernon has what we call a comprehensive college counseling program which means we start in grade nine working with students and we work with them through their senior year. In grade nine, students um, are the, getting the benefit of having three college counselors at any given time. We don't specifically assign a college counselor until the spring of a student's sophomore year. And in grade nine, the conversation isn't like, where do you wanna to go to school? Because that's really stressful to a ninth grader and it will definitely change before their ninth grade year is even over. So in ninth grade, we talk about how does this place work? How is a GPA calculated? What's the difference between an honors and an AP course? What's a resume and why is it spelled like Zoom? Um, and we help students kind of build that foundation that they need that then we'll use later in the college process. Now, in 10th grade, it becomes a little bit more introspective. Who am I as a person? We do an, an amazing piece that you'll hear about a little bit later called You Science, which is a comprehensive personality, aptitude, um, and career assessment practice with our students in 10th grade. And we do specifically assign them that college counselor. And then that college counselor not only works with them on the college process, but helps with academic advising, because we do find that those two things are inextricably linked starting in that sophomore year. We will be offering a series of workshops for our current ninth and 10th graders starting in this spring semester. And it'll look a little bit different. Um, in a tr traditional year, we would go into GTD classes and work with students in those kinds of small groups. But just given the constraints and that so many of our students are virtual or in person on, on um, a changing basis, we'll be offering some virtual workshops that any students in a grade level will have the opportunity to opt into. Um, and then in junior year, we do so much fun prep work for the college process, like thinking about letters of recommendation, thinking about how we want to craft an essay to tell a story. We have individual meetings with our juniors to get to know their strengths, their desires, their heart, and we help them build a customized list of colleges to start considering beyond on the ones that they already feel like they're excited about. And we have a family meeting that year as well, which we're currently in the, the time frame of doing right now. And that's where we share and we have the student highlight in a student-led conference fashion what they've already done to begin preparation for the college process. So that at the beginning of their senior year, when we craft their individualized timeline and plan for when they're writing all of their individual essays, their supplements and working on applications, uh, that we are able to narrow that list down to about six to eight schools that they will eventually work on. We got a lot of questions um, from folks about what our students do. You know, so where do they go? Where do they apply? What does it typically look like? And who best to tell you but the kids themselves? You know, And so we, we wanna walk you through a couple of previous classes to, to show you 
uh, where it is that they've gone. So May 1 is National Decision Day. And that's a day where we ask students to wear something from their college to show off where they're going. And this was a picture from May 1 from the class of 2016. Um, this it, per class in particular, you can see some statistics about where they were able to go to school, how much money they brought in, excluding hope and uh, athletic scholarships. Um, in particular, this was a really successful year with Georgia Tech. 85% of our students who applied got in and they all went. <laughs> um, and they have all, uh, had an amazing experience during that time. In the class of 2017, you'll see that this picture highlights the senior retreat, which is typically something that we do with our students in August. This was at the time, the largest class was 78 seniors. And a trend you'll start to see is the number of different schools that they attend. So 78 seniors went to 46 different schools. So that means even if they apply to a lot of the same schools, because you'll see that that happens like, oh, well, my friend applied to so-and-so, so now I suddenly want to go there too. Even if that happens, have faith in your student that they will ultimately come to the decision that is the best fit for them. And when you see that many different schools that students are attending, it means there are so many that are the only student or one of two students going to their individual schools, um, which is incredible. And when we talk about the scholarship dollars like you see reflected here, when we say excluding HOPE, that means if they're staying in state and they've qualified for the HOPE or the Zell Miller scholarship, that $6 million for the class of 2017 doesn't include that. It also doesn't include any need-based aid or loans. It is 100% merit-based aid, which is based off of their academics. So the transcripts that we send, um, their test scores, and based off of their leadership and their involvement as communicated by the application. In the class of 2018, this is another May 1 picture. Um, and this particular class, 75% of the students went out of state. And you can see from their shirts, the array of where they're going. We had a student who took a gap year, which means they're admitted, but they say, you know, I'm gonna take a year and do something else. And that can be service, that can be traveling, it can be work. Um, and every school kind of creates um, and serves gap years differently. But again, this class was 72 seniors and they submitted almost 400 applications applications and they were very adventurous in where it was that they wanted to attend. In the class of 2019, this is another picture from May 1. Uh, this is another adventurous class in terms of the difference of schools that they attended. So 71 seniors went to 44 different schools. We had four um, athletes that went on to compete in this particular class. And then in the class of 2020, from the most recent year that we've had, this picture with them from 2020 is in the senior retreat. And this particular class, uh, which at the time we always say was the largest class, 80 students, over 400 applications, 77% of those applications resulted in a yes which is incredible. Um, they brought in six and a half million dollars in scholarships, not including those big pieces. And here's what I wanna point out to you. There were a lot of questions around, well, what, where are my students going? And are they only gonna to wanna to stay in state to go to Georgia? The class of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, half of their senior year was spent in quarantine. 65% of them still went out of state. And I think what's interesting about this is that that number would have been much higher, very candidly. There are a lot of families who made the decision to stay a little bit closer to home just with the uncertainty of things that were happening. But when you look at the financial incentive to go out of state for some of these students, they were bringing in more scholarship opportunities from out of state schools that made it as affordable or cheaper for them to go out of state as it did for them to potentially go in their home state. Um, this year with the classes that we are working on, it's so exciting because we're working with students who are applying all across the board. The class of 2020 had a student who ultimately chose um, to attend school in, in China. This year we have students who have applied in Canada and the UK. And you can see the class of 2020 here, this was their full list. So every college you see here, at least one student was admitted. The names that you see that are in bold are where a 
student attended. And if it's a bold school where a student attended and more than one student went, you'll see that reflected in the parentheses. For example, we had two students go to New York to NYU. We had two students go to Florida, to Florida State. We had seven who went to Auburn, 11 who went to UGA, but we only have one who went to Dartmouth or only one who went to Penn. Um, and so we're really, really proud of these lists. If you want to see the full lists of where our students have attended from the classes of 2015 and on, you'll see a link um, that's on this slide. It's just mountvernonschool.org slash college dash counseling. Um, and you can also look and look up and we have comprehensive lists available that include all of those years if you're interested in seeing more. Great, thanks Erin. Um, so there's a couple ways that you can stay informed about all things happening in the College Counseling Office. As Erin just showed everyone, um, that list of acceptances, you can actually follow along our students' journeys um, through the college application process via Twitter. Um, in that picture that you see behind those three students spelling out UGA is a giant picture of the United States map. And it, sometimes we've actually had to um, be improvise and create different countries on that map, but that map is where students are actually recording where they've applied to college. So students will put a pin in the map if they've applied to a school, they will pin the map again with a green pin if they've been admitted, and then ultimately um, that journey ends when they put a flag in the map and they have decided to attend a particular college and submitted their tuition deposit. To see um, that journey and to celebrate our students with us, you can follow, follow any of us on Twitter, hashtag MVPins. Um, and right now is an especially exciting time to be following hashtag MVPins because the last bulk of our acceptances are starting to trickle in and we anticipate a lot of exciting news in the coming months. Um, another way to stay abreast of all things college counseling, and that's happening here in the College Counseling Office, is through our bi-weekly newsletter, College Connection. Um, this informational newsletter is sent out to families via Blooms, and it's also on that Mount Vernon lookup. And it pretty much documents all the colleges that are coming to visit us. It will give important reminders about graduation and senior pictures. It will talk about well, most recently, it'll be talking about summer programs, because believe it or not, it is now time to start thinking about summer programs for your students, even though it's freezing cold outside. Um, so that information is all housed in one place. And that's a living fluid document that you can check bi-weekly, even if you don't check blooms on MV Lookup, to see what's happening and to keep yourself um, sort of alerted to all the colleges that are coming to visit us. Um, as you can imagine right now, all of the colleges that are visiting us in the fall and this, and even this spring will be virtual. Um, it may be a little bit of a blended um, situation next um, fall with you know colleges coming to campus and doing virtual visits. Regardless, all of that information will be easily gleaned on the College Connection. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, we will actually have one published this Friday. All right, so one of the questions that we received when we sent out that survey asking, what would you like to know? What can we support you with? How can we spread the word? Um, and one of the questions that we got was, what are colleges looking for? And as you can imagine, we could probably do a 30 minute or more presentation on that. So I've really broken this down for the sake of the audience so, to some pretty general concepts that are that may seem kind of intuitive or they may even seem simple, but they actually make a tremendous amount of difference. And I'd like to focus more on not necessarily the academics because everyone's academic journey is going to be a little bit different. So I'm gonna talk about this in a little bit of more general terms. Um, as many of you know, part of the college application process is documenting the activities that you've been involved in. It's going to be receiving recommendations from your teacher, writing essays, things like that. And the reason why colleges wanna capture this information is because they wanna get a clear idea about who you are. So one of the things that we are often asked for um, by our parent community is what should my student be involved in? Should they be a well-rounded student? What activities can my students participate in that will distinguish them in the application process? Which is a very valid and important question. Um, there is, I think, an overall agreement that we all wanna be well-rounded, right? So if you have a well-rounded student, meaning they're involved in a little bit of everything, that that 
paints a great picture, right? Who can argue with the fact that being well-rounded isn't a good thing? Being well-rounded is great. However, being well-rounded isn't necessarily a distinguishing factor when it comes to seeing um, and reviewing a pool of applicants that have all been well-rounded and involved in diverse activities. Um, so we encourage students um, to not only participate in activities that will allow them to foster a sense of well-roundedness, but we really want students to follow their passions. And when students are following their passions and outletting that passion in and out of school, we call that a spiky student. And colleges are really looking for spiky students, which means perhaps your student is very interested in, let's say, football, arts, and for fun, we'll say writing, creative writing, right? Like how can I create a spike out of those three things? Well, if you're really into football, are you just playing, you know, at school? What position of leadership do you have within that team? Are you coaching at school? Are you doing something with the lower school to help with their athletics program? What are you doing in your neighborhood? So as you can see, it's about identifying your interest and then propelling that interest into different aspects of your world. So like not only your immediate community here at school, but also your greater community. And in doing so, you're also seeking out positions of leadership. So if you're really interested in writing, start a creative writing club at school. Maybe you want to start a reading series here in the community where other people who don't have an opportunity to express themselves through their creativity, you can create a platform for that. And that shows not only us, you know, that you have passion and that you're interested in certain aspects of your life that you're that transcend just general interests and things that you can find here in school but it also shows an amount of grit and grit is really really important when you're thinking about the college application process and in a nutshell grit can kind of be like well what does that actually mean because I feel like we all have a sense of what it means but grit is really about pursuing your passion no matter what right like maybe you were really interested in this election and you were like you know what I'm going to do a phone bank oh I can't vote I, it's okay, I'm gonna start a phone bank. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna go, you know, door to door and I'm going to promote whatever candidate. That's grit, right? Like you are doing almost the impossible. You can't express your voice through the voting process because you might not be old enough, but you're going out in the community and doing as much as you can to make sure that other people can do what you can't do. That's grit, that's perseverance. That is probably, I would say when you look at students who are getting into these really competitive and wonderful institutions, they all have some kind of grit. They have a sense of character that um, invites itself to sort of like challenging adversity and following their passions. And that tells a better story about who your student is than just simply being well-rounded because they can see how creative you are in finding outlets for the things that you are passionate about. Um, I would also say um, when it comes to academics, I don't want to get too in the weeds with this because there's a lot of myths that we're going to talk about in a minute, but rigor is very important in the college application process. And rigor doesn't mean that your student needs to sign up for every single AP imaginable at Mount Vernon and then take you know, APs outside of Mount Vernon and just kind of go AP crazy. That's not necessarily going to be helpful to you if you're not getting A's in all those APs. It's much better to get an A in an on-level or honors course than just to get a B or a C in an AP. It's telling a better story. A B could be a blemish on your transcript if all of the courses that you have participated in, you've received A's in except for your AP courses. So if you are comfortable taking an AP course and you're really passionate about that subject matter and you've done well in that subject matter, historically, then go for it. But there's other ways to demonstrate that you are pushing yourself academically. And that could be by taking an honors course. It could be by just receiving a B plus instead of a B or an A plus instead of an A. The most important takeaway when we think about rigor in general is that you have to kind of um, encourage your student to interrogate whether or not they're really pushing themselves or if they're playing it safe. So push yourself in ways that you can because that's gonna help tell the story about your academic aptitude more than anything else, that you're willing to challenge yourself, however that looks for your student. All right, so this kind of goes into some facts and myths and you may have already sort of gleaned that I kind of hit on one and that's, you know, 
let's just we'll kind of jump around here because I was just talking about APs, but there is a misconception that students should take all the APs available to them because that's going to make them really competitive. And there's a misconception that, you know, since students max out their AP curriculum here at eight APs, that students applying from other colleges that have 15 APs are going to be um, more competitive than the student that only is walking away from their high school education with eight APs or even five APs. Um, that's a myth. The important thing to understand is that colleges are going to be reading our students within the context of our school. When we send out an application and application materials to colleges, we also send out a school profile, which highlights for the admissions professional reading that particular student's application, how many APs we offer, what are the number of APs that students can take before they max out our AP curriculum. Um, as you, um, in the middle school begin transitioning into high school, you're gonna learn that we have caps on the numbers of APs people can take. So colleges will absolutely not hold that against a student. They're gonna be reading your student within the context of their peers and of their school. Um, colleges do not have quotas, right? So that's something that we hear a lot. Like, well, you know, if, if, you know, if all these people are applying to UGA and everyone's really great, how are they gonna choose who they are gonna admit? In the, you know, the answer is, is everyone who meets their, you know, who meets the criteria to be admitted to UGA will be admitted. There is no quota. So that's a myth. So if you ever hear someone saying, I didn't get into Georgia Tech because they only allow, you know, seven kids in, that's not true. They will allow in as many students as they possibly can that they believe can handle the rigor of their curriculum. Remember, colleges are trying to find reasons to admit you, not to deny you. Okay. Um, again, students definitely want to push themselves, but not to the sacrifice of their GPA. I'd much rather see a transcript, even as a college admission professor and, um, and professional and as a college counselor, I'd much rather see, you know, a transcript full of A's and on-level and honors courses than a mixture of rigor with a bunch of C's um, on a transcript. So just think about, you know, the idea of like, what's that actual story going to be and how can I show these college admission professionals that I'm pushing myself without sacrificing my GPA is important. It's also important to know that, you know, even if your student didn't have a great year, you know, when they transitioned to high school in the ninth grade and they didn't do so great, it's hard to acclimate into high school. That's also something that colleges aren't going to, you know, hold against the student necessarily, especially if their GPA improves. So each year, a student's going to have a cumulative GPA for that particular year, right? You'll have a GPA, a cumulative GPA for ninth grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade, and ultimately when you're a senior in the 12th grade. If you're on an upward trend with that GPA, that's gonna speak volumes to your academic aptitude and ability to handle a rigorous college curriculum. In fact, it'll also show them that you were able to persevere through, through a very challenging time that you may have had. Colleges will look at your student in context. You know, COVID has impacted a lot of people's GPAs. A death in the family can impact a GPA. Moving around a lot can impact a GPA. These are all stories that we will help communicate to the admission counselor reviewing your student's application to help them make sense and to put them in context to the grades that they've received throughout their high school career. Um, another myth I think that is out there that is kind of like a myth but not a myth um, is legacy. Um, important thing to note, colleges change, right? The selectivity of colleges changes throughout the year and throughout time. Um, I predict that Georgia State University is gonna be the next UGA in 10 years. I really do, I think it's really headed there. And I think we're gonna have, you know, people saying, well, I went to, you know, Georgia State and I went to UGA and, you know, my whole family went to UGA. Is that gonna help me get into that school? Because my parents, my uncle, my sister, everyone in my family went to UGA. Well, that's awesome, and they definitely love to see that on application, but that's not going to help your student be admitted or not admitted to an institution because UGA in Georgia, they have a lot of alum. They have a lot of people who went to UGA, and the admission standards for UGA have changed over the years. Legacy is something that, you know, in a highly selective institution that, you know, colleges will look at and say, wow, this, there's a tradition of this family coming to this school, and that's awesome, and, you know, Maybe that student's more likely to come here then. Who knows? But there's definitely a legacy of this school. Students love to see that. Who wouldn't love to see alum, you know, applying, you know, you know, having students apply that have 
parents that went to that college, but it's by no means going to help your student's application to an extent that it would mean they're being admitted over not being admitted. So that's an important thing to kind of wrap our minds around. You know, it's information is helpful. It's great to have that. It's a way to maybe demonstrate interest in a unique way, but it is by no means um, a guarantee that you're going to be admitted into an institution simply because of legacy. Um, and then um, Dr. McCubbin or Aaron talked about this a little bit earlier, um, gap years. Um, and that's something that we hear a lot, especially now in the time of COVID. And let me just kind of give you an idea of what a gap year is so we can talk about what it isn't. So a gap year is something that students may elect into after they deposit it to a particular school and for whatever reasons they're unable to attend. Many colleges will allow students to defer admission up to one year after they've submitted a tuition deposit. However, that is not a guarantee. Highly selective institutions and you know, it, not even highly selective institutions. I shouldn't have said that. It really depends on the institution, but some colleges don't even allow for a gap year or for a deferral. It really depends on the school. Um, we expect and um, the we make sure all students at least apply to college and are admitted. You know, we don't allow student. I mean, even if a student isn't thinking about taking a gap year here, we still encourage students to at least have some acceptances because we want them to utilize the resources available to them and the high touch, you know, sort of counseling that we give here in school that you may not receive two years down the line um, if you decide to take a gap year and you have no college options. But that is something that's an option for students. I would say if your students can considering a gap year, look at school sponsored gap years. I know at the school I used to work at, and went to at the new school in New York, they had a global citizen year, which was basically a service gap year that you would also receive some college credit for, for when you decided to go to college. But it was um, a more, I would say, academically focused, I'm preparing you for college gap year, which I think can be really beneficial to students. But just know that, you know, that is an opportunity and that is something that's available to students, but it's by no means a guarantee that all schools will allow you to take a gap year every school is a little bit different. And should that be something that your student ultimately decides to do, we will guide them through that process. COVID and college admissions. I'm happy to say, hopefully, for most of you, this will be nothing you need to even worry about when your student's getting ready for college. But for those of you who have students that are rising juniors, um, or even, you know, rising sophomores, this may be something that's been on your radar and it's something that you may have been a little concerned about. There's also a lot of disinformation going around, I think, about COVID and college admissions. First, let me just let you know, colleges have not closed down. No schools have closed because of COVID. Um, they have really been doing a great job of hybrid learning and doing some virtual learning as well as on-campus learning. Some schools are in session, some schools aren't. It really depends on the school, the size of that student body and where they are geographically. The biggest impact that we have seen from COVID in the college admissions is actually, in my opinion, a positive one in some ways. And that colleges have started piloting test optional programming and, and review processes. And that's because of the limited access students have had in the last year to take the SAT or the ACT. Um, what we have found though, is that these pilot test optional review processes are extending. And some of them are extending on into the next application cycle. And some schools are even considering going away and doing away with testing in general, which is very interesting. Um, and I think it's been definite, a president has been sent with his many schools that have gone test optional. And I think that they are finding that their application pool has definitely increased, but the way in which they review hasn't dramatically changed because colleges have been reading more holistically. So in terms of the impact that COVID has on college admissions, we'll probably be seen more so in the incoming junior year class because the admission process might be different in terms of schools that may be test optional or might not be test optional. But hopefully for our folks that are in the lower school, um, by the time your student is working with us really closely, um, this will be a thing of the past. All right, another question that we get that I know causes a lot of anxiety for folks is testing. And we talked a little bit about how COVID has impacted testing, but I really just kind of have this infographic here just to give you an idea of the differences in minutiae, sort of about 
what are the actual differences between the ACT and the SAT? And as you can glean from this slide, it's mostly about timing, right? One's more of a time test, one's not. Um, there's one that allows you to use a calculator a little bit more, one doesn't. I think the important takeaway is, is the SAT and um, ACT in general are kind of the same in terms of what they test content wise. There was recently a re, not recently, felt recently to me, but SAT has redesigned its test. Uh, a few years ago, it used to look very different and now it's much more closely aligned with the ACT. So really when you're thinking about what test should my student take, at this point, think more about am I better at time tests or am I not? And one thing that should be very um, much so on your radar though is, is my student receiving accommodations at school? So there's an accommodation process that is very different for the SAT and the ACT. And it's something that if you are going to take um, the SAT and you need accommodations, that's something that you're going to have to do through College Board itself with the support of Samantha Flowers. Um, who I believe is actually here as well in on this call. Um, and similarly with the ACT, there's a different process to receive those accommodations as well. Um, there's even different requirements in terms of the validity of a psychological evaluation. The ACT really needs a psychological evaluation with recommendations on what those accommodations are for your student that's no, long, that's no older than two years old. So for those of you who have some time, just kind of have that in a nugget in your brain. It's very different for the SAT. And if you receive accommodations for the SAT, your student will receive accommodations for anything that's housed under the college board, which means your um, AP tests will be approved for accommodations. Your PSAT will be approved for, for accommodations, but your ACT accommodations have nothing to do with the college board accommodations. So the takeaway here is understand that if your student has accommodations, depending on which test they take, will dictate the, um, the material that you need to submit to Samantha Flowers to make sure that your student is receiving the proper accommodations that they need. Um, one of the things that um, you will most likely be encountering before the SAT or the ACT is the PSAT. And the PSAT is basically a practice SAT. That's just the way to think of it. It's low, no stakes. We do not require students to study for it. There's no prep process. If you're paying for, you know, prep for the PSAT, you are wasting your money. It's really just a barometer and to get your student familiar with what it is like to take a standardized test. These tests are taken by students that are in the 10th and 11th grade, and we don't send these scores to colleges. This is really just information for your student. Um, in fact, Unfortunately, the College Counseling Office has absolutely no control over testing. Your student owns their College Board account. Your student owns their ACT account. Your student is the only person who can submit those scores to colleges. Um, that's something that's often um, a misconception, and it's something that we will talk about more as your student moves along through this process. But it's just important to know that the, for most of you, the next big test that you're going to be taking if for your student is gonna be the PSAT and that's nothing to worry about. That's nothing that we're sending to colleges um, and we will provide you with information as your student moves along through this process. So if that felt like drinking water out of a fire hydrant, it was, but it won't be as you begin moving through this process. So when we think about testing, it's often the first thing that comes to mind for a family of what you have to do to get ready for the college process. But the, the theme that we want to really make sure you walk away from today is the fact that a student story is made up of so many different touch points and so many different aspects of the Mount Vernon experience. One of the aspects of the Mount Vernon experience that we think provides just really unique and dynamic stories is the Innovation Diploma Program. And a lot of our grade six through eight families had questions about what was ID and how did it work with the college process and with the upper school experience. So we wanted to give you a snapshot of curricularly how it fits in. So you can see that in grades nine and 10, it covers the humanities curriculum, which is your in ninth grade world history and world literature and in 10th grade American history and American literature. It covers the biology and the chem part of the chemistry credits in 10th grade, and then some of the connections courses, the maker design and engineering and studio design. But then a bulk of the work that a student will do in ID are the design briefs, which 
are student experiences where they're doing client-based work with real stakes. So if you've seen the stories that have come out of Mount Vernon about the virtual reality exhibit at um, the Center for Civil and Human Rights, or if you've seen the Delta prototypes or the giant Millennium Falcon um, that we built with Magic Wheelchair a few years ago, those are some of the snapshots of stories that students have worked on in design briefs. And what's unique about Innovation Diploma is that their, their approach and really being the leaders um, in the school of thinking about how do we get out of the mindset that learning about history only happens in history class or that learning about math only happens in math. And when we apply our learning in a real world context, learning is happening constantly and from every single medium. And often what we see as the difference for students who are in innovation diploma is that when it gets to the point where they're asked to tell a story in an essay about a time that they've failed or a time that they've had to learn to think about something differently, their arsenal, their toolbox of stories to pull from are incredibly deep. And so that is one of, we think, the hallmarks of this program in particular. If you are interested in Innovation Diploma, Brad Droke, who is the director of the program, um, has done a great information session that's available on Mount Vernon Lookup that you can look for to learn more. Um, the application process is underway this week. And if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out uh, via email and we'll help you get connected to the right place if you have additional questions there. But stories don't just happen in an innovation diploma in the upper school. Um, in this next picture, you will see one of my favorite stories. So we started hosting something called the Mount Vernon Roundtable a number of years ago. And this came from my time on the college side where we would bring high school counselors to campus and to get them to learn about our school and get bought in and eat good food and then become uh, people who promoted our school for us. And we thought we could flip the script. And that's where the roundtable came from, where we invite colleges to Mount Vernon annually. And we have them learn more about us. We have them give us feedback on things that we're doing. We introduce them to students and have them see that experience firsthand. And we're very targeted in the schools that we invite based off of the schools that our students are incredibly interested in or that are consistently interested in. Um, and a few years ago, we ha had the, the guiding question at the roundtable of what is a Mount Vernon student? What is our portrait of a graduate? What do you, when you are looking at our students, see pop off the page? And this was the product. So take a second, look at it. You can ignore the interesting shape of the, the person, um, the changing in the different fonts, but I think what the, speaks the most volumes from this picture is what is absent. I don't see anything about A's or grades, do you? It's all about what they can do. It's all about how they think. It's all about what they value, the impact that they've made and the way that they'll engage. It's about having a heart and wanting to connect to people. And I love this picture because anytime I feel like my compass is going in the wrong direction, because it's so easy to get caught up in the hype around how can I get the highest GPA or how can I get the highest test score? This is what grounds me, is that that is not what the college process is about. This is what the process of learning and growing a human into a functioning member of society is about. It's a student who's empowered, a student who's excited. And the way that you do that is you have an engaging curriculum that releases the pressure of the learning. Uh, I came from the product of a high school that was incredibly focused on grades. And for a long time, that's how I measured my success. And I tell this story to students all the time and they laugh. Um, I took a zero honors or AP courses in high school. I kind of floated through and I was really into competitive debate. That was my thing. And so I could care less about my classes. They didn't make sense to me about how they would impact what I cared about. So I focused on debate and that's what got me to college and, and got me through college. And it wasn't until I got to college where I was having more experiential learning that I realized that I cared. And then I suddenly wanted to know things and how they work together and, and dive into topics that I had sort of ignored in high school. And that's why I chose to work at Mount Vernon. And that's why I love this place is that 
the approach to learning through competency-based education uniquely gives the ownership of knowledge to our students. And I hear you, it feels scary. We are so used to using the uh, what actually comes from the meatpacking industry in terms of how we grade and evaluate students with, with numbers and with letter grades. But at the heart of learning, it's about reflecting on that learning and understanding why it's important and why it builds into something that makes you a high contributing member of society. And two examples that I'll give you specifically this year that I have seen come to fruition to be really powerful that speak to this are, are one, I was meeting with a student last week who got his ACT scores back and, you know, he actually scored much higher than his initial goal score was. And for a lot of students, they would be like, cool, I'm done. This student wanted to sit down and actually go through all of the subscores to better understand which aspects of math could he improve on, which aspects of the English section were the areas that he struggled in because he wanted to really specifically pinpoint areas where he could grow rather than just arbitrarily saying, I wanna get my, my number higher. And that is not a conversation that I've typically had when it's come to test scores. It's just been, how can I get higher and how can I get higher? And as we talked about it, the student reflected that he's started to think that way because that's the way that altitude gives him feedback. So as he's been getting more feedback from his teachers in his courses at Mount Vernon, and it's been tied to the, the power standards and, and the outcomes that we have listed there, he's been able to reflect and have a higher letter, level of metacognition about his own learning. And he's become interested in his areas for growth. Um, and that's gotten him excited uh, about learning. And that just that was just kind of really a, an exciting moment for me to see what we're doing every day in the classroom spilling over to another aspect of a student's life. Another example that I'll give is when we think about metacognition and reflection on learning, it comes into play when we tell stories and the essay process. It's becoming more and more common that we see colleges that ask the question of why do you wanna study this? Or why this major or why this school? And it's really tempting to answer that with a, well, I wanna to go to Tulane because of New Orleans, or I wanna to go to NYU because of New York, or I wanna to go to Georgia because football. And those are not the kind of answers that colleges are looking for. And so when we can help a student really dive deeply into a program or a, a learning track that they're interested in a college and compare it to a program or a learning track that they've done while they're at Mount Vernon, it not only helps them have a more specific, informed, and intelligent answer, it also allows them to showcase the way that they own and, and are proactive about their own learning. And that self-determination and that self-advocacy, I mean, you know, you have teenagers or close to teenagers. That's what all of us as parents hope to see in our, our children. Um, and that is a direct result of the way that CBE empowers our students to excel because we don't want them to just get into college. We want them to be successful when they get to college or when they choose not to go to college because they're ready to go ahead and do something else instead. The way that this translates into a transcript piece is that and the reality is we do live in a HOPE GPA world. Uh, while Mount Vernon's education um, is absolutely one of the most progressive that I've encountered and so well regarded and respected in the higher education community, the translation of that is still dependent on putting that into a letter grade for a transcript. And that's something that has been in our practice for a number of years. We always have ha had some kind of uh, grade on a transcript that is able to calculate into a GPA. And that GPA and that grade, that's not going away. There, there are no plans for us to eliminate that. I think that that's, that's a common myth that I hear pop up um, from year to year. And it just comes from a place, I think, of having an education experience that might be different from the one that we've created. But I can confidently tell you that we have letter grades that translate into GPAs for our students. An A is equivalent to a 4.0, an A plus is equivalent to a 4.5, an AP course adds a full point to a GPA, an honors course adds a half point to a GPA, um, and the NEPAD scale that we use, so the proficiency scale that we use in altitude has a direct translation table that is transparent to families. It's available in our division head letters that we send out. It's on the Mount Vernon webpage. It's something that we are very upfront about so that a student and a family can use altitude learning at any point to look on that progress tab and see exactly where a student is. But we do try to 
with our transcript tell a broader story than just a GPA because we know that our students are more than just a sum of a couple of letter grades that translate into a GPA. And that's why our schedule with our unique courses that our students are able to opt into tell a story as well. Um, I was talking in the chat privately with a family with a student who's interested in computer science. And it, for a student who's interested in computer science, perhaps they take the track of taking our, our computer science single mod courses before taking AP computer science. And then in addition, they could take advantage of some of our virtual reality or our programming courses or some of our maker courses that have that thread. And so the pattern and the story that emerges for each student through a transcript is much more than just a, a numeric GPA. It's about trends and it's about intentional choices that lead to those individual interests. Um, there's nobody that you can't love if you know their story. We believe that firmly in our office. And story is just a part of a transcript. Story also comes from letters of recommendation. It comes from their essays. It comes from their ability to, to woo an audience through an interview. Um, and the story piece is, I think, what Mount Vernon does at its absolute very best. So the next thing that we talk about is We've gotten all this information about, you know, some of the facts and myths and CBE, but uh, one of the questions that we had was, well, I don't even know where to start with my student. Um, so we always recommend starting with the basics. Your students, whether they're in middle school, whether they're in high school, have varied interests. And so um, thinking in terms of big bucket majors or um, opportunities that they enjoy, um, you know, kind of leaning into some of that. Second, um, I always use an example of knowing what you don't want. We've all been in that situation where it's like, hey, let's all go out to dinner. Um, you know, when we could go out to dinner um, and it's like, well, what do you want? I don't care. What do you want? Well, you always know what you don't want. And sometimes eliminating the, the subjects or the interests that are not interesting to your student can help narrow that field um, to make that piece more manageable. Another suggestion is asking questions of the pros. So we have an extensive community here at Mount Vernon through different families um, and partnerships. And so if your student is interested in a particular job or a career field, um, chances are really high that somebody in the Mount Vernon community works in that field. And a lot of times asking a question, hey, how did you get into that industry? Or, or tell me some of the high points or like, what should I be doing? Um, can sometimes give students a clear path because of somebody who's already walked that path before. And additionally, um, um, for students, I know for our middle school families, it seems like a far, you know, a far away, but it actually comes a little quicker than you imagine. Um, but we do something every November, which is we meet with every single junior student one on one, we ask them to bring a picture of themselves happy at college. That doesn't mean like write down the school that you want to attend. It's, you know, when you close your eyes and you imagine school, um, what does that look like for you? And sometimes those pictures often reveal something about what the student cares about that they didn't realize was important. Um, my, some of my favorite things are, uh, you know, when students put mountains and, and nature around and they, you know, and, and we ask them about that and they're like, yeah, that I really do like that. And I want my college campus to reflect that. So we take a lot of care in how we um, evaluate those pictures and, and what we do in those meetings to create a customized college list um, that really leans into the things that students care about. Additionally, we use some scientific diagnostics as well. So this is one of the big um, platforms that we use. It's called U-Science. It's an individual diagnostic. Um, it takes about 82 minutes to complete. So we usually have students at the end of their sophomore year complete this over a couple of days. Um, and what happens is like it will, you know, you play brain games and then it will come up with this. So this was a snapshot from mine because all the college counselors took this diagnostic before we allowed students to take it just to make sure it worked. Um, and fun story, all of us, um, a career match that Matt, for all of us was guidance counselor. So um, we all thought that that was pretty great that it, um, that it was so unique to us. In addition to career matches, it also has college suggestions as well. And what this does is give your students a toolbox of vocabulary words to be able to talk about themselves. Um, the college process is not the time to be humble. Sometimes it's difficult to, to really express like what is important and, and what you're really good at. Um, you sign really helps get a jump on that, as well as having Aaron and Ryan and I be your students hype person all the way through this process. 
So another question we got is, am I behind? And the answer for middle school and high school parents is absolutely not. Um, we have created such a comprehensive plan and we work that plan so that every step of the way you feel supported and you know what's going on. Everything is in microbytes so that nothing should ever feel like a stressor. So for my high school parents, um, we are you know, suggesting like if your student is, as they're going into their junior year, if you wanna take some time in the summer and do some in-person college tours or some virtual visits, it's absolutely take part in that um, and, and participate in those programs. Every school is going to be a little bit different. Um, as Ryan mentioned, college in the time of COVID has really changed things, but there are schools that will offer in-person visits as long as you are following protocols, you get temperature checked, you wear masks. Um, some larger institutions are only offering self-guided tours or virtual visits, um, but it's worth looking into because you do get an opportunity to actually be on campus, interact with an admissions officer or student leader to get a more concrete feeling of what that school might be like how that school might fit in for your student. Um, we mentioned earlier about college reps will come to visit Mount Vernon in a, in a I say in a normal year. Um, we typically have, you know, over 125 colleges that will come to visit because of our central location would become a really popular destination for schools. Um, also, a lot of larger schools put regional reps in the Atlanta area, including Alabama, Auburn, Ohio, Kentucky, um, even Long Island U University. Um, and so because they're here in Atlanta, they know us really well and they come to visit us and our students get an opportunity um, to meet um, with those reps. And students, um, while you know we highly encourage it for um, juniors and seniors, sophomores and freshmen are welcome um, to come in as well just to start to get their feet wet. Um, you can also request information from colleges. So if you're interested in, in visiting a school or interested in a school that's really far away, doing an information request and getting an official brochure or packet um, helps start that student in their system. So if that is the school you're wanting to apply to, um, they can see that you've been in the system for, for a little while. Um, one of the new things that has come out um, and has how colleges have pivoted is through the prospective student classroom experience. Um, so there is one at Syracuse for students interested in engineering. I have a student um, who is interested in um, Washington University in St. Louis and actually participated in their business day. So he actually got to sit in on a lecture with a business professor. And that's one of the reasons that pushed him to apply, which is really exciting, is that he said, I could actually see myself in the classroom because I was in the classroom. Um, and that was just exciting. And I love that colleges are starting to do that. And every place is a little bit different. So we can help guide your student to that if you're interested. Um, and then the, the kind of asterisk on the last one is the college led, um, uh, the college counseling led college tour. So this is typically takes place the first week of June. Um, Aaron and Ryan and I, we coordinate, we plan everything, including um, um, after tour events. And this is one of our favorite things to do in the summer to kind of kick it off. Um, unfortunately, we've had to um, pause, put it on pause for this year, um, but we look forward to having it for summer of 2022. Um, we typically take students uh, around the Southeast. We've done um, a leg that is North and South Carolina schools, and then one that was um, Tennessee, Alabama and Florida schools. So it's a week long. Um, we have a ton of fun. Uh, so again, look forward to that high school parents. So for middle school parents, um, really this is what the, the biggest piece is that we want to um, kind of reiterate is just building that foundation, like helping your child um, set goals for the year, checking in with them about schoolwork and deadlines. Um, students sometimes get to the college process in their junior and their senior year, and what they're going to find from, from the college counselors is that everything has a deadline, like colleges um, tend to be pretty firm about that, so we want to practice those good skills so by the time they come into their freshman year, they understand that like schoolwork and deadlines is important in the classroom, but it's also important in the college process as well. Um, and start building interest in extra extracurricular activities. We kind of talked about the, not kind of talked about, we did talk about this earlier about the quantity versus the quality being a spiky student. Um, so looking for helping your student, even in middle school, start to build those, um, you know, build those skills and build those interests. So if your student is in Girl Scouts or in Boy Scouts and like, what does that look like going to the highest rank of Eagle Scout? Um, or something like that, like that all starts um, in middle school. 
And the next one I, I can't emphasize enough is make reading fun. So reading in, reading print, whether that is, uh, you know, a young adult novel or if it's like, uh, you know, a comic book, something that is in print, not on a screen, um, is one of the biggest indicators of student success and how well that they will perform in the classroom and on standardized testing. So starting those good reading habits in middle school will pay in dividends by the time they get into high school and get ready for the college essay writing process. Um, and another thing um, that middle school students can do and really high school students can do as well is explore nearby colleges. And what I mean by that is that if you are taking a family vacation and there is a college nearby, you don't have to necessarily sign up for a formal tour, but you can drive through the campus. You can get out and walk around. You can, um, you know, stop in, um, you know, at the school's coffee shop and just kind of talk to other students and see what their experience has been like. Um, another great way to get a feel of college campus while also engaging in some really fun learning is summer camps hosted on college campuses. So for example, Georgia Tech and in higher education, we love acronyms. So they have the PEAKS program, which stands for Programs for Enrichment and Accelerated Knowledge in STEAM, which is, again, another acronym embedded in that. Um, but this is um, a really wide program for middle school and high school students. They're typically a week long. They typically have very focused areas, um, and that's offered at Georgia Tech. UGA has a summer academy for ages 11 to 17, so each one will have their own, um, their own requirements and age limits, and that includes things like animation, architecture, a mini med school, so they have have one for middle school and one for high school and even video game design. So this is a way that a student can increase their learning, follow their interests, but then also get a feel of like, hey, this is kind of like, I really like this campus. And I've actually had a few students who have gone to things like soccer camp at Wofford and decided that they wanted to apply to Wofford because they, they were on their campus for a camp. So what can you be doing to support your student? Like what did you, what can you be doing? And so support your student is the first one. They're gonna go through so many different iterations of who they are and what they want and having your acceptance and your support every step of the way is just so valuable. Um, you know, we help them like kind of narrow down what they might wanna do through um, through you science and through our junior one-on-one -on -one meetings, but we want that support at home as well. Um, this is another theme that you'll hear in college counseling is comparison is the thief of joy. Every child is on their own path. And, uh, you know, one of the most harmful things I think we hear is, well, so-and-so applied here or so-and-so heard back from this school and I haven't yet. They are on their own path and so are you. There's never a point where we will let your child fall through the cracks. Um, we will, you know, make a very firm plan with deadlines. And as long as they meet that, they are going to be successful. And what success looks like for another, for one student is totally different from a, a, somebody else. And that's okay. We celebrate every student and every win um, because students, our students are worth celebrating. Um, also building relationships with us. Um, I think going back to like the, the facts and myths slide, um, a lot of times it's, it's, well, I heard from somebody else. I heard from somebody else. Part of what we do as college counseling is stay on top of trends um, at, that are happening in colleges. So if you're hearing something that doesn't sound right, knowing that you can come to myself or Aaron or Ryan to ask those questions to say, hey, I've heard this rumor. Is this actually true? We're here to help um, kind of, uh, you know, squash those things that, that may be causing you stress. So building relationships with us helps you feel comfortable to come and ask us those questions. Also staying connected through our, like we said earlier, our communications platforms is a great way to make sure that you are up to date with everything that's happening in our office. Um, and then also, I think this is really something big too, is helping your child start to advocate for themselves. Um, and this means like taking the lead on emailing teachers or their college counselor or college reps. This is especially important in their junior and their senior year, because this is really the time that they start transitioning to their first phase of adulthood. Um, and I can tell you from experience, I, you know, I had a student that was interested in a school this year. She took full lead on communicating with the college admissions rep. And because of that, that college admissions rep was able to advocate for her in the admissions process. And he even pointed out to me when we talked afterwards, after her acceptance, that he was like, it made such a difference that she took the lead and emailed me and was on top of her process. Um, so it does make a difference. And we can start those trends in middle school, start those habits in middle school and in high school. So those are just some, those are just some tips from everything that we have seen. 
So I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Um, so at this point, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us, but we're going to stay on and I'll stop sharing and then um, feel free to unmute yourself or ask questions or you can continue to ask questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Ariel. You're welcome. Is there any questions that Aaron or Ryan and I can answer for you today? When do when do you typically go on on college tours and go? And do you do that in there? Like Grace is a rising junior, mm -hmm. so just do I look to next? Do I look to this June July to go on college tours? I'm not quite ready, but. Oh, or, That's a, I mean, next year is kind of too late. So. Uh, well. And that's a great question. And the good news is, is that in Atlanta, we have so many different types of institutions that are within driving distance. So if you just wanted to kind of, you know, dip your toe in the water with college yeah. tours this summer, that's totally fine. So, I mean, you have Kennesaw State, um, which is a larger public institution. You also have Georgia Tech and Georgia State that are really close together. Um, you have Oglethorpe, which is a smaller private school. Mercer is only about an hour and a half away. Um, you can make a, make a weekend trip up to Greenville and go see Furman and Clemson. And so two totally different institutions. So um, as they're going in from their sophomore to their junior year, a college tour here and there is, is just a great way to see what they want. And like I said earlier, what they don't want. So if they walk on Clemson's campus and they're like, this seems great, but I just can't see myself here. That's good to know because then we'll, then we know like in their junior process, when we meet with them in November, um, that, Hey, you know what? I, I liked Clemson, but I didn't quite like the size. Could I find a smaller engineering school? And then we, that's part of what we do in that junior meeting is help narrow that down. But we have students that will, um, you know, tour and juniors, um, get something called the golden ticket juniors and seniors. They get two excused absences to go and visit a college campus every year. Those are not, you can't save them up the, um, and use them all in one year. So it's, two for junior year and two for senior year. But then, you know, so if you all wanted to go on a college tour in fall of you, their junior year and miss a Friday class, it will be counted as an excused absence. And I'll just add that given the current climate, I don't think that a family should feel pressure to do visits before junior year starts. You will not be behind, like Ariel said, if you're not doing college tours until some point in junior year. And even some families wait until after the junior one-on-one -on -one meeting where they have a list to work from to then help figure out when it is exactly you know that they want to go see something. I would just think those tours would be um, very, I mean, obviously, I don't have a, a reference for here, but aren't they very guided by what the child, what the student uh, is interested in doing? I mean, I wouldn't just go and look at a college because a friend went there, I would look at it for a particular program or interest. Yes, I think you will find that there are families that fall into both camps. There are families who are looking at a school because they don't know anything about it and they want to learn more. And then there are families who are going to do like specific research, as you mentioned, and the tours will look different. If you are signing up for a general tour through an admissions office, that's going to be a generic welcome to our university. Here are the big picture items tours that apply to everybody. They have specialized tours or customized tours that you can special request where you could sit in on a class or talk to a professor or do an overnight in the dorm. Um, and those kinds of experiences okay. would be much more fine tuned to a student's specific interest. Okay, thanks. I think I would also add, don't shy away from visiting colleges within the, re you know, within our area that your student may not be interested in, just to get a feel for the kind of campus that your student may typically end, you know, end up wanting to be a part of. Um, we're so lucky here to have a great example of an urban campus with Georgia Tech. Uh, we have Mercer, which is a great example of a more like rural campus. And then we have, you know, UGA, which is that typical college town experience. So even if your student isn't interested in studying in Georgia, just seeing schools that are around us here in the city and, you know, sort of within the suburbs is a great opportunity for your student to kind of get a feel for what an urban campus is like and if that might be a fit if they decide to do something that's outside the state that's in an urban environment.
All right, well, if there's no other questions, please feel free to um, jump off and continue with the rest of your day. Again, we appreciate your time and appreciate your patience as we went a little bit over. Um, this is such important information. And if you, there's anything else that we can do, um, please reach out to us and we're happy to be of service. Thank y'all so much. Y'all are amazing. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.